Today in episode 492 of the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Podcast, we chat with Seth Godin. Drop the mic. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. Welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing genius. I'm your host, Timbo Reed. But you, so much more importantly, you're a motivated business owner, ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. And that's exactly what we do around here. Plus, you can join our free Facebook group for some ongoing accountability and support. Just search for the Small Business Big Marketing Tribe on Facebook. Big episode today. That, I've got to tell you, is the understatement of the century. The marketer's marketer, Seth Godin, joins us. Pretty excited about that. This week's Monster Prize Draw winner has seen website traffic increase by 2,000%. And SEO expert Sam Hempel shares his top five SEO tips for 2020. Plus, I'm going to give you a little insight into next week's guest, who's worked with the likes of George Michael in excess pink, seal, the list goes on. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Before we meet today's guest, which who is an absolute ripper, uh, I just want to remind you of a, another podcast that I'm involved in that I host. It's called The Idea Exchange. It's brought to you by American Express, and it's an 11-part series in which I have deep interviews with 11 amazing Australian business founders. We talk about money management, people and culture, growth strategies, uh, work-life balance. It's available on iTunes and Spotify right now. I think I think we're up to episode four. Um, some incredible people that you are going to love the stories of and the advice they give you. It's called the Idea Exchange. I would encourage you to go and have a listen. All right. So I have wanted to get Seth Godin on this show for the past 11 years, but I stopped trying after a knockback about eight years ago, which is completely dumb. It goes against everything I stand for. But I did reach out to him. He said no. I subsequently found out through a listener where he'd found a little excerpt of Seth saying there were too many podcasters and bloggers trying to build personal brands off the back of interviewing well-known people. And I always wondered whether that was the reason he'd knocked me back. I don't consider myself one of those people. I hope I add value to your business beyond just interviewing well-known people. But anyway, I sort of gave up. Lip was hanging down and I was all a bit sad. But then I had the opportunity to interview Seth again. So who is Seth? That is a great question. Although if you're asking it, boy, you know, if you've been living in a hole for the last few years, he's the author of 18 best-selling books on marketing. You've read Purple Cow or Lynchpin, right? He's also an inductee into the Direct Marketing Hall of Fame and the Marketing Hall of Fame. He's the founder of the Alt MBA and two companies, uh, Yo-Yo Dean and Squidoo, which were both acquired by Yahoo. He's also the writer of one of the most popular blogs in the world. Now, getting Seth on the show would be to a tennis podcaster like getting Roger Federer. Okay, you got it? Got it. Seth is the marketer's marketer. So without further ado, here's Seth. Seth Godin, welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Only the miracle of technology allows two people as far apart geographically as you and I are to connect in this way. I think it's fantastic. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't have done it back in the day. Now, Seth, I'd love to start by talking about your wife, Helene. And for listeners, she owns the largest gluten-free bakery of its kind in the world. Her product is available in 50 Whole Foods stores thereabouts. She employs around 60 staff. And Seth, you attribute her success to one simple idea, which is that her offer isn't for everyone, but it might be for you. Can you explain what you mean by that and how other business owners could adopt this thinking? Well, I'll start by pointing out it's totally her doing. Uh, I'm just a bystander. But the thing is that if you're going to run a gluten-free 
dairy-free, kosher bakery. You've eliminated all the people who say they want a baguette and all the people who say they want a croissant and all the people who say they want a cream pie. And you have to be comfortable saying to those people, well, it's not for you, but there's a place just down the street that might be. And that is a fundamental shift from, well, you can choose anyone and we're anyone. That the magic of By The Way Bakery is it's not for anyone. It's for someone. It's for someone specific. Do you run the risk then of alienating potential customers? Well, isn't that fantastic? Isn't that exactly what you want to do? Because if you stand for something, then that means that some people aren't going to like what you stand for. There is no, not one, successful, small, or medium business that has succeeded by appealing to everyone. There's not one. Mm -hmm. Mass is completely dead. The, The most successful TV show, the most successful movie, the most successful song reaches a couple percentage points of the world population. That the best-selling book in America last year was only purchased by one out of every 200 people. Does it frustrate you then that the majority of business owners, and I sort of represent the smaller end of small business, don't have the courage to stand for something and are taking a scattergun approach to attracting customers? Well, you know, the word courage sort of brings shame into the conversation, and I'm not ready to do that. Uh, I think that there's been a fairly universal brainwashing that went on. And uh, it's a brainwashing that starts in school because school is about fitting in all the way. That's how you make it through high school, that we are taught to do well on the test, to match the answers the teacher has in mind, to be uh, generic, because that is what factory owners want their employees to be, replaceable. So. If the brainwashing leaves us believing that our job is to be the same thing to everyone, well, then I'm not surprised. But Mm -hmm. my work is about teaching people that you get to do work that matters for people who care if you can find the guts to do so. So so just to sum up that discussion, Seth, are you very much a supporter of the concept of an inch wide and a mile deep when looking for a niche? I don't think we need to go a mile deep. I think that what we need is to matter. And Mm. it's surprising how few people we have to actually matter to to be worth it. So Kevin Kelly coined the great phrase, 1,000 true fans. So if you're a solo freelancer, if you're someone who's a writer, singer, dancer, person who makes a living by your wits, if you have 1,000 people who care deeply about what you do, that's enough. 1,000 people paying you 100 bucks a year, that's enough. If you want to open a restaurant in Perth, 10,000 people is more than enough. If there are 10,000 people who will go a couple miles out of their way to come to your restaurant, you're set. You're done. That's all you need. And the magic of small business is not to pretend that we're a big business that got shrunk. The magic of small business is to embrace the fact that we don't need to be Walmart to be happy. In your most recent book, This Is Marketing, and by the way, the acronym for that is TIM, so I thank you for that. I don't know whether that was intentional, but (laughs) I'll take it. You you talk about the concept of doing work that matters, work that you're proud of, which is what you're touching on now. What are you most proud of when it comes to your extensive and deep body of work, Seth? Um, Well, I'm not really spending a lot of time looking at a particular idea or riff. I measure... Did the people I teach something to teach it to someone else? Because that is how you make change happen. That if someone read Purple Cow or Lynchpin, if someone took the Alt MBA, if someone uh, engaged with something that I've built, and then they went ahead without my permission and taught it to someone else, that's a home run for me. Mm. Mm, That's a good outcome. I want to talk about your president just for a moment, and I'm not seeking a political view from you whatsoever, but I am interested in how would you describe Trump's marketing abilities? Okay, so marketing is not advertising. Marketing is the story that you live and identifying really clearly who it's for. What cannot be argued is that despite 
the behavior and uh, activities of the last two and a half years, 40% of the population still thinks he's doing a good job. Maybe it's 30%. Well, that's marketing. Because if you figure out who your base is, whether you're running a hot dog stand or a scuba diving supply store, you need to make things for that group of people. Now, we are not having a conversation about statesmanship and leadership. That would be a whole different conversation. But in terms of identifying those who, those who it's for and making it for them, that's a variation of marketing. Has there been a moment in his um, time in office where you've gone, that was genius, what he did? Or not yeah, really? I don't use that word the same way that some people do. But yeah, okay. uh, from I think that there's two kinds of marketers in the world. There are innate, naive marketers who are doing it without a narrative. And then there are professional marketers who are thoughtful about how they are doing it. And I don't think there's any doubt that he's in the first category. There are plenty of people in plenty of fields who have gone very far on the basis of that innate instinct. And I think his instincts have been proven again and again to match what the base is interested in. Can you give, me, give us an example, Seth, of a small business that is cleverly following a narrative in their marketing? Um, oh, sure. Now, I, I'm very careful when I talk about examples because as soon as I um, talk about one, they do something that ends up stumbling and so then it's my <laughs> fault. Yeah. But it, you know, in Purple Cow, I wrote about a company called Little Mismatch. Making socks is really easy. You call up China and they ship you socks. And as a result, it's a commodity business because almost everyone has feet. Almost everyone needs socks. Socks are really easy to purchase in bulk. Sell them at a cheap price, you're done. And that's why almost no one is successful at socks. Well, this company, Little Mismatch, decided that there were 12-year-old girls out there who had a sock problem. Not all 12-year-old girls, just some. And their problem is that they don't have enough to talk about during recess. And what Little Mismatch did was ordered a bunch of socks and then mixed them up. And you get three socks for $10 and they don't match. Mm. And so what you end up doing is wearing socks that don't match to school. And you then show up and talk to your friends and say, you want to see my socks. And that is the slogan for the company. You want to see my socks. Because the other girls, shamed at the fact that they are not as fashion forward as their friend, go home and say to their mom, Mom, I need new socks. And so the idea spreads. And last year, as far as I know, their sales have been pretty steady. They did 40 million US dollars in revenue selling socks that don't match to 12 year old <laughs> girls. Now, they didn't do any hard sells. They didn't do any hype. They didn't do any trickery. They do exactly what they say they're going to do. And now they make mismatched gloves and mismatched furniture. You get the idea. The point is, Anyone could have done this, but no one had the empathy to see a 12-year-old girl for who she was and to give her what she needed. We're chatting with marketing author and teacher Seth Godin. And Seth, you mentioned Purple Cow, which you wrote in 2002. 17 years on, would you say it's harder to stand out today when there is a proliferation of everything? out in the marketplace than it was when you wrote Purple Cow, which was all about being being remarkable. Right. So you just said two things that aren't the same. Standing out and being remarkable are not the same. Okay. You can, you can stand out by stripping naked and running down the street, yes. Yes. but it's not going to get you uh, the following that you seek, at least in the long run. Being remarkable means that the people you care about will talk about you to other people you care about, and they'll talk about you in a positive way that causes forward motion. Well, the magic of being remarkable is it is self-cleaning and self-limiting. That once there's a lot of noise in a space, we redefine that space so that the noise is normal. So when I wrote that book, I don't think YouTube existed, which meant that to make television that was remarkable cost millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, then YouTube shows up and Charlie bit my finger, goes viral. That video costs a dollar to make. 
So then we have all this froth around YouTube videos. So yes, if you want to make a $2 video that's going to go viral, that's way harder than it used to be. Mm. But because there's all this noise, we define all the noise to be normal, and it is still possible to break through that noise, whether it's by making a movie that people talk about or a commercial that people talk about, because we don't keep talking about all the noise. We wait for the next cycle of culture. And from a macro point of view, it's noisier than ever before. But from a micro point of view, which is all your listeners care about, there is a group of people who are bored, who are disconnected, who are restless. And if you show up and give them something to talk about, they'll talk about it. You're on a winner. Just to um, get clear on Remarkable, Seth, I so a little mismatch is remarkable in the way they go about their marketing and their product offering. I had a guest on the show a few years ago, Arthur Greeno of Chick-fil-A, and the entire conversation was around Remarkable Marketing, and now I'm questioning whether it really was. What he was doing, for example, in order to bring people into his Chick-fil-A franchises for Australian listeners, that's like Red Rooster. He was breaking Guinness Book of World Records. He was having, he was putting on the largest iced tea ever in the world and getting the community to come and contribute and getting a whole lot of PR. That sounds to me now that that's standing out. That's not remarkable. Is that, am I on the right track? Right. So those are stunts. And the people who yeah. run Chick fil A are not in the stunt business. Now, uh, I don't know what country Arthur was in. Oh, he's in. He's actually in America, and he okay. he's their most frustrating franchisee. <laughs> well, they don't have franchises; they have uh, managers. There's a couple franchises actually that they're trying to phase out, but this could be the reason. Here's what bad. is remarkable yeah. about Chick Fil A: hmm. if I am from a certain stripe of the demographic, if I believe a certain set of things, talking about my allegiance to Chick Fil A advances my standing in the community. Saying to the baseball team that I coach, hey kids, you want to go to Chick-fil-A, identifies me to those kids and to their parents as one of us, in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. That in the US, Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. Now, they have to pay rent seven days a week, but they are closed on Sundays. They do that because of their allegiance to the tribe that follows them. Because being able to say to your friends, let's meet at Chick-fil-A, that is the remarkable thing about that company, not that they did a stunt. Good clarification. Seth, um, I talk to a lot of business owners, as you do, and small business owners, and it's not uncommon for them to say, oh, marketing, I don't do any marketing. It's all word of mouth. Right, exactly. What, what do you say to them? Well, of course you're doing marketing. That's what marketing is, right? Marketing is work that matters for people who care. It is not advertising. It is not hype. It has nothing to do with the Guinness Book of World Records. It has to do with have you earned trust and attention? You earn it by making a promise and keeping it. And making a promise and keeping it is your job. So I, uh, I tell the story of uh, having to replace the boiler in our 100-year-old home. And I called six companies because they're all the same. And I, whichever who is cheapest, I get to do the work. And the first guy shows up and he's taking his boots off. I thought, you don't have to take your boots off. It's just down the basement. No, 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 I insist. And he puts on surgical booties. And he's going to go down in the basement and look around. But before he goes down, he hands me a clipboard with eight sheets of paper on it. And he says, I'm going to go down and look around, but take a look at these list of your neighbors, because if there's any of them that you want to call about the work we did for them, that would be fine with me. He's good. And on the eight pieces of paper were names and phone numbers of dozens and dozens of my neighbors, many of whom I recognize. And when he got up to the top of the stairs, he was about to tell me how much it cost. And I said, you're hired. And then I called the other five people and had them not bother coming. Because that kind of marketing make, makes people less price sensitive. Well, you're only price sensitive when you have nothing else to compare. Price mm. is the last refuge for the marketer who has nothing better to say. And in his case, what became clear 
is everything he did was about getting my name on that sheet of paper, not the sheet of paper of people who were paying him, the sheet of paper of people who were vouching for him. And if all he cared about was that I was going to vouch for him, I wanted that guy to install my boiler because that's what I wanted him to care about. Seth, I know I've heard you talk about the fact that whilst you are one of the world's more famous marketers, there is only a million people that, that know you in the world of how many billion. But I do wonder whether Mr. Boiler Fixer knew that he was going to Seth Godin's home. Oh, I can promise you that this plumber has no clue what I do for a living. And so a million people do read my work every day. I, I think there's probably more than a million people who know who I am, but I'm not recognized very often. And the number of times that I am treated better than fairly by a typical tradesperson is close to zero. No, I don't right. think we're skewing the results here. <laughs> I love it. Seth, you say marketing, and I quote, you say marketing is the generous act of helping someone solve a problem, their problem. Marketing helps others become who they seek to become. Can you riff on that a little? Sure. So, you know, if we think of the Chick-fil-A example or the little mismatch example, they're both similar. Or the fact that I'm coming to Australia, that's another example. Like if someone brings a friend to see me in Sydney or if someone uh, says to their mom, I need new socks, or if someone says to the baseball team, I'm taking you to Chick-fil-A. In all three cases, they're doing the same thing. They're adjusting their status in the community by using an external signal to establish their affiliation and their taste and where they are in the hierarchy. And everybody who isn't starving to death, that's all we do all day long. And it's just like when two dogs beat in the street. The most important thing to those two dogs is no longer what will I eat for dinner. It's this dog across from me. Who's up? Who's down? Who's the alpha? Who's the beta? How will I engage in this transaction? But what human beings have done is turned all that barking and sniffing into things we buy and to places we go and to culture we talk about. One, one of the things, I, again, that I notice in my travels talking to business owners is the products and services they create, Seth, are not necessarily what people want. Uh, there's a lot of businesses that are creating products or services that they create maybe through laziness or just through through lack of thought. What, what is the key to building a framework for creating a product or a service or an offer that people really want? So, I, you know, I've been an entrepreneur since 1974. It's hard. It's really hard. We're not talking about that fancy venture capital thing where you get to go to parties and someone else gives you money. We're talking about real business built from the ground up. It's hard. And so what we do often is get selfish. And we say, I really need this sale. I really need this shelf space. I really need to use the resources I've got to make some money because otherwise I'm in trouble. And as soon as we start getting a little selfish, then we say things like, well, I can spam people a little bit because it probably won't get me in trouble. Or I can cut corners a little bit. Or Someone could come to me and I can say, no, I never heard of my competitor. You really need to buy from me. And when we start going down that path, we, that our selfishness and our fear surfaces in a form of non-empathy. But the alternative is to say, wait, I have a chance to show up as a trusted agent of change and help people get where they want to go. And what I can say to people who don't want to go where I want to go is here's the phone number of my competition because they're going somewhere else, right? Come along if you want. That if you're driving the bus from here to Melbourne, don't try to persuade people they want to go to Melbourne. Just make sure your bus is going to a place enough people want to go. I, I like the, um, I've, I've heard you talk about, Seth, the idea of, there's, there's an old quote, I can't remember who said it, but people don't want a, a one-inch drill bit. They want a one-inch hole. You don't, want, you don't believe they want a one-inch hole. What do they want? Right. So I went a little further than Ted Levitt on this one. And what I said is, no one wants a one-inch hole. What are you going to do with a one-inch hole? What you want is a place to put the lag bolts. No, actually, what you want is a way to hang the shelf. Well, actually, what you really want is the way it makes you feel when your spouse says, thanks for cleaning up the den. That's why you went to the hardware store, for that feeling. I love that. Pushing it to the end benefit, really. Seth, one of the things, certainly, I love 
about your work and the way you get your points across around marketing. Uh, and having spoken to many people about the fact that I'm be chatting with you and what they love, is your ability to tell story in order to get the point across. And by way of example, I've heard you talk about the irrational pursuit of becoming irresistible. And you use the case study, which I love, of the uh, Apinacon Hotel in Canada that serves an unreasonable amount of ice cream for just $3. I just, it puts a smile on my face every time I hear this story. What do you love about the offer, about that offer? So Fiona, who owns the hotel, spent summers at that hotel as a kid, and she saved it from demolition. Her motivation in serving an unreasonable amount of ice cream for $3 is not to manipulate the marketplace, to get on my blog, to have people talk about it, to, to somehow help her business. Her motivation, because I've stood next to her as we've talked about this in front of the ice cream stand, is because she can, because it reminds her of how she felt. And because her goal is to help that four-year-old or that nine-year-old or that grandmother develop a new lifelong memory. As a side effect of it, she has proven all the smarty pants business people in her life wrong because giving away more ice cream than is reasonable actually is the smartest marketing she's ever done for her hotel, which is fully booked every single night it's open in 2020 already. And it's all due to ice cream. The, 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 so as you call it, the softball size serve of ice cream. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you're not familiar with softball, it's more, it's probably closer to a bowling ball by now. But the thing <laughs> is, it's not, the ice cream is a symptom of a perception of how to be in the world. Mm. And, she has decided that the Opinicon is an excuse to help people's dreams come true, not that people's dreams are how she's going to make a living. Seth, I live in a little seaside village and there is no shortage of ice cream shops and I love ice cream. And there are two that I go between, but there's one that I generally favor more. It's actually further from my home. And I'm not sure what the question is here, but so the one that I go to the most has the best ice cream. It's, it's by far and away the best ice cream in a place where I live called Noosa. And they give you very small serves. They never give you any more. It's, it's measured. It's a, I would say they're a bit tight in the way they serve up their ice cream. Good for them. Yeah, yeah. They don't allow samples. Yep. And it's an in and out. And it's a busy, busy place. The one closer to my home, I would say the ice cream is... 80, 85% as good as the first one, but the serves are so much bigger and I love it. And every time I get one there and it's cheaper and the biggest, and every time I get it, I was like, wow, this is awesome. And I look at the people around me and they're going, this is awesome. Look how much ice cream we've got. Who's, who's getting it right? Well, I'm so glad you're bringing this up because it could have been believed from my Opinicon story that what I'm saying is the more you give away, the better yes. you are at marketing. That's not what I'm saying at all that Fiona is not in the ice cream business. Fiona owns a hotel. And the ice cream is a performance that she offers, and it doesn't matter whether it makes money or not. Now, in the case of these two ice cream places, the first thing I'm going to say is, I believe that if in the middle of the night I switched the ice cream in the two stands, it would take you more than one visit to decide that I had done so. That your belief in the ice cream is what you're buying when you go to the expensive place. Probably not the ice cream itself that human beings are fairly discerning. But for example, the Journal of Wine Economists has done a study in which they found that trained uh, sommeliers and others always prefer $100 bottle of wine to $20 bottle of wine, unless we switch the labels. And if we switch the labels, they always prefer the $20 bottle of wine because it tastes better in a blind taste test. It just does because it's more palatable. It's more approachable. And so the story we tell ourselves about the wine is what we're paying the extra $80 for, not the wine itself. Mm. So with that said, I love the fact that the ice cream place not close to your house has made a decision. And the decision is by being strict and rigorous and focused on a certain kind of quality, they can charge a certain price. And the people who pay it are happy to do so. And the other place says, 
If you want to tell yourself the story that you are smarter than the people who went to the fancy place, this place will let you tell yourself that story. Now, both places could be making the same profit. I have no idea. What matters is what story are you allowing people to tell themselves? And what we know is that the market is bifurcating, that the luxury goods sector is doing better than ever, that the super discount sector is doing fine, but it's the boring middle. In the boring middle is where people are really panicking. We're chatting with the marketer's marketer, Seth Godin. Seth, love you to riff on just a couple of topics. Uh, social media. Do you think social media is a scourge on society or is it the best thing that's ever happened to small business marketing or both? Okay, well, it's not social, first of all. It's hardly media. But the most important thing to remember is you are not really the customer. You are the product that these public companies are manipulating our attention and our trust. They are creating conflict. They are pushing us around so that we will come back for more because that's how they make a profit. So they can sell our data and our attention to the highest bidder. And you don't have to like social media or not like social media. It's not going away in the near future because they have hacked our desires and our attention. Now, if you are a marketer who is buying ads on social media, you have a couple challenges. The biggest one is you're in an auction against other people who also want to buy that very same attention. And what we know about an auction is that the second worst thing is to come in second. And the worst thing is to win because it means you outbid somebody who is smarter than you. And if I look at something like Google AdWords, there are people who are paying $100 a click for certain categories in Google because it's worth $101 to get that person's attention. So they're making a rational choice, which is paying less than the marginal benefit. However, like a landlord, they're keeping 99% of the upside. That the difference between a retail business that fails and a retail business that succeeds is a retail business that succeeds pays 99% of its profit to the landlord. And one that fails pays 101%. But the landlord wins either way. And the landlord now is Google and Facebook and the rest. So the way around it is to buy attention when you have to, but to treasure and earn attention when you can. Because when people talk about you, that doesn't cost you any money. The trick is to get them to talk about you in a way that helps you achieve your goals. You're right. It's not very social, but it is called social media. And you probably answered my next question. Um, getting someone's attention is an honor and we should treat it with kit gloves. I guess part of treating it with kit gloves is responding. And Seth, you get a lot of comments on your posts. You don't reply to any. Is that simply because there's just far too many and you don't want to, want to be sitting there replying? Or is there another reason? Well, actually, I don't get any comments because I turn them off 12 years ago. Um, and I wrote a post about why I turned off comments on my blog. There might be comments on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Yes. And I have never read one of them because I already wrote that blog post. I'm not going to write it again. And advice on how to write that blog post better doesn't help me. But what I said about comments on my blog was simple, which is this. If there are comments on my blog, I'm going to read them. And reading anonymous feedback from people that's often not positive would make it so that I would start changing how I write. Because if someone didn't understand paragraph two, then the next time I'd write paragraph two more clearly and at greater length. And what I found myself doing when I had comments was not writing the way I wanted to write. And I realized I only had two choices, a blog with comments that had no blog posts because I would stop or a blog without comments. And since I've stopped reading my reviews on Amazon, it has made me a better writer and a happier person because I'm not writing for someone who doesn't get the joke. I'm not writing for someone who didn't want to go on the journey that post went on or that book went on. And so giving me feedback is really a way of saying what you believe and what you want. And I, you are totally entitled to want what you want and to believe what you believe. But that's not what I came to talk about. 
Mm. And so I'm happy to say it's not for you, but I'm also not motivated to make it for you because then it wouldn't be for the people it is for. Just to finish that, Seth, for, for me, heading into 2020, social media for my podcast, which is now 10 years old, has always been a bit of an Achilles heel. I don't love it. I'm also the father of three teenagers and I have mm -hmm. even more reason to not like social media. Um, I want to embark on a deeper and more extensive social media campaign next year, which I'm pretty sure is going to result in more people reaching out, commenting, having opinions. I feel that in order for that to be effective, I should be replying. And I'm kind of looking forward to replying because if I don't, I feel like I'm being disrespectful to my listener whose attention I've worked hard at getting. Just to finish that discussion around your social media, and I know you're not a disrespectful person, so please take this as, it, as it's meant. Sure. No, it's, it makes perfect sense. Isn't it a bit disrespectful not to be replying to at least some of them? No, I, here's my take. I think that what marketers do is we make promises and we keep them. I made a promise. My promise is I'm not going to read your comments. My promise is comment if you want on your space, comment, build your own blog, go for it. But I'm not going to read them. But I also made the promise, which I've kept at great expense, that if you send me a respectful, non-anonymous email, I'll write back. And I've done that 144,000 times. I should stop doing that. It is not productive. Please, if you are listening to this, do not write me an email. And if you write me an email testing me, I'm just going to delete it. But leaving that aside for a minute, the thing is that what your audience really wants is for you to lead them and for you to connect them. There is an infinite number of people who are willing to live this false transparency, this false authenticity. There's no such thing as authenticity. We stopped being authentic right after we got out of diapers. We are well aware of what we can say and do to get what we want. And so the person who shows up and answers a bunch of comments isn't authentically interested in doing that more than anything else in their life. They're doing it because that's the role they're playing. Well, I am choosing to play a different role. And I get the fact that I have lost 80% of my potential audience because I'm not willing to throw myself in the mosh pit. That if I posted pictures on my Instagram of me meeting celebrities instead of posting pictures on my Instagram that aren't pictures that are teaching people stuff, I'd have way more followers because we are now armchair citizens who are just sitting there tut tutting our way through the parade of people who are trying to get just a little bit more attention from us. But it doesn't stick and it doesn't help us make the change we want to make. You know, the Mona Lisa is really big on Instagram, but she's dead. She doesn't even have an account that it's not disrespectful. The Mona Lisa is talked about, but the Mona Lisa didn't say, and I will eagerly respond to all of your questions about my smile. I was in Paris about a month ago and there was a 90 minute wait to see her. I refused. Good for you. Yeah, I'll see you on social media. Seth, podcasting, you have a show called Akimbo, which is all about changing the culture. Where's podcasting at in your mind and what needs to happen for it to become mainstream? Well, podcasting is mainstream. 25% of the people in the United States listen to a podcast last month. Podcasting is not a business, just like blogging is not a business. Uh, you, you can use a blog, you can use a podcast, you can use a telephone to accomplish some other goals, but only one out of every 10,000 people who have a podcast is going to make a good living at it. That's not why you should have a podcast. You should have a podcast because it's a wonderful, wonderful chance to have a small group of people come to hear you and listen to you and trust you and to give them something to talk about. And it's something you can do at very low cost if you care. And that's the way I feel about blogging too. So that's why I have both. If you care. Very, very critical words. Seth, you've been to Australia. You're coming to Australia again in May 2020. I'm interested in your view on the level of customer service in Australia. I've on a number of occasions sat with Americans where customer service is fantastic, in my view, in your country, uh, less so here. I, uh, In fact, uh, and I know you hang out with, at pretty fancy places here. I sat next to you at a table at the Park Hyatt in Sydney once. Um, so the customer service there was pretty good. I was I well behaved? I hope. 
I, look, I don't know. I was like, I'm not going to bother him. I wasn't stalking. It was just an absolute coincidence. But you were. You were. You mean, if, if well-behaved means you weren't dancing on the bar, then you weren't dancing on the bar. Certainly. I mean, I left early, so you may well have continued. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a view on customer service in Australia? Not really. I think that um, customer service, as Tony Shea showed us at Zappos, is your choice. Cost of doing business or a leveraged opportunity for growth. And at Zappos, where the record is eight hours and 30 minutes on one customer service call, they used it as a leveraged tool for growth because they were better than everybody else. They were better than they had to be. On the other hand, if it's just the cost of doing business, it's like asking, what do I think of the temperature inside most retail stores in Australia? You need to have the temperature be what the temperature is to get the customers you need. It's not a moral failing. It's just what promise you're going to make about the temperature and what promise you're going to make about customer service. And the secret, the key, is to be clear about the promise and then keep it. Seth, uh, thank you so much for making the time for small business owners who are listening in Australia. For those who want to reach out or not reach out to find out more about Seth Godin, go to sethgodin.com. You'll find his books, podcast, his alt MBA, which we didn't even get to talk about, Udemy courses. And Seth, you are coming to Melbourne and Sydney and then Auckland and Singapore in May 2020. Where, where can people get tickets? The easiest thing to do is to type my name and then World Tour 2020 into your favorite search engine. I've listed all the places I'm going with links to each of them. Seth Godin, uh, I'm now walking over to my bucket list and putting a big tick on it. Thank you for Yay. joining. Uh, thank you for joining us on the Small Business Big Marketing Show. An absolute pleasure. Great to talk to you, Tim. Well, there you go, team. Seth Godin. How good was that? Now, you'll find links to all his resources in the show notes. Coming up, another listener wins big in this week's Monster Prize Draw, plus SEO specialist Sam Hempel shares his top five search engine optimization tips to get you found on Google. But right now, here's what grabbed my attention from chatting with Seth. Attention grabber number one. I love his quote, this isn't for everyone, but it might be for you. Now, if you've got a thousand people who care deeply for what you do, then that's more than enough to build a great business, as Seth said. I think sometimes as marketers, we try to just accumulate this massive, massive audience or you know list of prospects, whereas really, we might need only a small percentage of that, but we want them, we want to make them care deeply for what we do. Attention grabber number two, I love Seth's ice cream story. Who would have thought? that the simple act of offering large serves of ice cream gets people talking and has such a huge impact on that hotel's overall business, almost running at full occupancy. Great stuff. Attention grabber number three. I love the story of the fellow who pitched to fix Seth's boiler. Now, as Seth said, if you aren't sharing your expertise, then you're stealing from the world. Now, that guy was clearly sharing his expertise by very cleverly sharing the names, phone numbers, and testimonials of Seth's neighbours. No wonder Seth said you're hired immediately. That's what grabbed my attention. Whatever grabbed yours, be sure to block out some time and go and implement it. Come on down. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. Coming up. SEO expert Sam Hempel shares his top five SEO tips for 2020, but right now, it's time to reward another motivated listener for taking some serious marketing action. And today's winner is... Wayne Stanborough of Runnymede Fire and Safety in Muldura, Victoria. And this is what Wayne had to say on an email to me. He said, hey, Timbo, listening to your podcast has helped me look outside the traditional advertising money spend and look at what I can do to market my business. On a past road trip, I listened to the two-part podcast with Dana on search engine optimization. That was an awesome two-parter, I must say. Thanks to the wonderful Dana. Wow. I used to get four or five hits to my website a week. At the time, I was using an old Mac application called iWeb, where I had designed my own, own website. I then found an iWeb SEO tool, thanks to Dana, and implemented to my to my website. The following week, I got 88 hits and now average 65 to 70 hits per week. 
That is an awesome increase, Wayne. Since then, I have taught myself WordPress, done a complete overhaul of my website to what it is today, including SEO and G Site Kit. <laughs> Don't even know what that is. You're geeking me out, Wayne. That gives me access to Google AdSense and, and, and analytics. Keep up the good work, Timbo, and I look forward to more marketing gold dripping my way. And one day, I'd love to be a guest on your show. Regards, Wayne Stanbra. Wayne, I love your work, mate. Well done for listening and and more importantly, implementing. As a result, here's what you win. $75 flora and fauna voucher, $50 sendal voucher, a lumber punks $100 voucher to go and throw some axes, <laughs> a 180 headlamp valued at 100 bucks, boxing gloves from Fitness Enhancement, 40 bucks, a range of liars spirits valued at over 500 bucks, Mr. Lee's noodles, 30 bucks, access to Jeff Anderson's video marketing course, 197 bucks, and a $100 voucher to go and buy some tradies underwear. Plus, you get promotion on this show and a backlink in the show notes. Wayne, that's got to be worth it, right? Everyone else, please enter the monster prize draw. Send me an email, tim at timreid.com.au. Share one idea you've learned from this show and implemented, what impact it's had on your business. If I read it out on air, you win. Now, we are here with SEO expert and longtime listener, which I love, Sam Hempel, who owns the Melbourne-based digital marketing agency, Miam. G'day, Sam. How are you, Timbo? Mate, I just love talking to people who actually listen to my show, you know? So, <laughs> well, here I am. <laughs> I, just want, I just want to thank you. <laughs> Anytime, mate. <laughs> Good idea. Now, Sam, um, you've just launched a book titled SEO for Australian Small Business, which in itself I think is an awesome effort and a much-needed resource. Now, with so, many, with so much information already out there about search engine optimization, what led you to writing it? Uh, well, as part of what we do in MAM, we run a lot of workshops. We also work with a lot of small business, and we found that there is a lot of um, – I guess people feeling scared in a, in a way about technology and also it, it's too easy to say it doesn't work and a lot of the information out there can be quite daunting and so we found that as we developed our workshops and as we developed the things that we did with small business that really bring it back down to, you know, the the basics and there's so much in the basics. You can get so much done by knowing a little and that's what the book is based on. It's, you know, it's 120-something pages but it is all around stuff that you can do that pretty much anyone can do themselves. And that was the goal. Yeah, well, that that's awesome. And, and you know, that's the spirit of this show too. So, exactly, uh, yeah. I, I think that's wonderful. And, you know, with, with search engine optimization, Sam, gee, I hear some bad stories out there. You know, there are, for every great story I hear about a small business person that has employed someone to do their SEO, essentially to get them on page one of Google, I'm going to say there are nine bad stories of people being ripped off. Couldn't agree more. And I think that's part of it as well. One of the big things that we push is just empowerment. And if you're running a digital business or not even, even if you're totally bricks and mortar, obviously your website is a huge part of that. And, you know, as small business owners, we all have at least a basic understanding of accounting. As an example, we've all got a basic idea of how GST works, BAS statements, deductions, and all that sort of thing. So at the end of every quarter, at the end of every financial year, there's less surprises because we have an under, a basic understanding of it because we have to. And it's exactly the same with this sort of stuff, whether it be SEO or Facebook ads, um, that sort of thing. To have that base understanding is really helpful as you go along. So there is less surprises and you don't get ripped off. Totally agree. Now, Sammy, it's time to geek us all out. Be kind. It is SEO. We are small business owners. We're, you know, we're fragile individuals. We're busy. <laughs> this is an area that freaks us all out. So what are your top five SEO tips for 2020? Number one. Okay. I'm going to start this out though, Timbo. I'm sorry to do this to you. I am going to start this out by, I'm going to put a little bit of a, a caveat around this. When you said, give me your top five, I th there can't be, there's, there are no, th there isn't just five. So what I've actually done is chosen five randoms because they're all equally important. So they're not necessarily, I'm not going to say that this is one is more important than the other. They're all really important and they're all really doable. Um, so I just wanted to start with that. Now, that's, that's really interesting because yeah. what you're saying in your, the 120 pages of your book, SEO for Australian Small Business, you cover a very, very wide, the entire range of SEO. Yeah. What you're saying, what I'm hearing is that they're all equally important. 
I would argue that, yeah, they are because some may have a smaller ranking factor with Google or with Bing or anything like that, but it's it's that whole idea of being involved, knowing what's going on. And yes, some things are going to have a greater impact, but with the clients that we've worked with, it's amazing how we found that uh, we might do a site optimization on, with one client and completely and utterly uh, shrink their page size in the sense of optimizing images and so forth. That's one of the points I'm going to get into shortly. And it has a massive effect on their SEO. And with other clients, we'll do the same thing. And it's not, it doesn't have the same effect. So it really can depend as well on your content and yeah. what your site is about and all that sort of stuff. So you never can tell. It is, it's not an exact science. And that's, and that's part of the fun, I think, is you never quite know what you're going to get. <laughs> Okay, number cool. one. All right, number one, content. So make sure you write like a human. And this has been said before, but it is really, really true. Like the, the days of keyword stuffing and all that sort of stuff are, are, are really gone. You know, keywords are still important, but Google, you know, unsurprisingly is actually really clever. So, you know, if you're talking about, say, a workshop, Google knows that you could also be talking about a class or a lecture or a tutorial or something like that. So, you know, synonyms are good, but don't go overboard. It's, it's got to read like a human. And the whole thing about every single bit of SEO is about your user's experience and if you're providing a really good experience for your reader, then that's going to flow through to your SEO. And content is one of those things. Things like using headings and lists and having lots of internal and external linking. Like if you write a recipe blog and you're, you know, you've got a recipe there that's got tofu in it, link to some other recipes that you've written as well that have tofu in it because it keeps your, your reader engaged. And Google will see that. And Bing, obviously, when we talk about search engines, we say Google, but we mean all of them, even though we really just mean Google for the moment anyway. And so that's the number one, I would say, is content and writing like a human. Okay, number two. Cool. Optimization of your website, so site speed. Things like three seconds is okay. It's better to be faster than that. But things like 10 seconds, 15 seconds, we've seen a lot of sites that run really slow and you can measure that and just go, well, you know, that's obviously not okay. And it's, it's, you keep your eye on that. Images, like I was saying before, is one of the biggest offenders. This is about bounce rate. If you look at your Google Analytics, there is a, a stat called bounce rate, which is basically how many people get to your website and then quickly hit the back button. Exactly. Or don't even, don't even get there. Is yeah. that, is, to solve that, Sam, simply about having a great host or is there something more that you can do? There's a lot in there. There's certainly a great host can help. Things like optimizing images is a huge one. Code bloat, which is really easy to happen on things like Shopify and WordPress. So every time you install the plugin, you've got another bit of code in your site. So one thing that we always recommend to people is if you are going to install a new plugin or a new theme in any one of those products is do a speed test using something like Google PageSpeed Insights or GT Metrics or something like that, which are all free. Do a speed test, then install the plugin and do another speed test and just see that if it if it's had an impact on that. And if it has, ask, the, ask yourself, do I really need this plugin? Is it really giving me the value to possibly slow my site down by a couple of seconds, which could mean a lot for the customer experience? And I think within that site speed and um, site optimization stuff as well is don't be afraid of hiring a developer to optimize if you're not feeling comfortable in that space. And I'd say that about everything too. With your content, don't be afraid to spend some cash on saying to a copywriter, hey, could you just have a look over my whole entire site and just give me some tips? Even if you don't want to pay them to do the work, you know, to actually, you know, update, update the content to at least give you some tips on how to make it better if you're not comfortable within that realm. Okay. To that point, Sam, who does the typical small business need on their digital marketing team. Now, I know there's a lot listening yep. who are st stuck in contracts with, dare I say, companies in India where they're yep. paying 500, 1,000, 2,000 bucks a month to do they're not quite sure what. Yeah. Who, who are you suggesting we have, on our, we have on our team? I think people who are good with words. So, I mean, SEO splits into three main pillars. You've got your on-page, your off-page, and your technical. So your on-page is your stuff like, is your content essentially. So if you've got people who are great with words, who understand how these things go and you can link your, you know, relate what you've written in one article to what you've written in another article and things like that, perfect. They're the kinds of people that you want on your team. So people who are great with words. As far as your off-page stuff, now that stuff of having other people liking on what you're doing. You know, Google knows that you love what you do. They want to know that other people know what you do. And so things like PR is great to have and, and marketing is going to help your off-page stuff. Uh, and your technical stuff, that's where you get into having, you know, a, a development team if you need it. It depends on the size of your site. And like I was saying, with all this stuff, to get started, you can do all of it you can do yourself. 
And then from there, work out what you're comfortable with, work out what you're not comfortable with and go, right, I want to spend some bucks on technical because that totally freaks me out, but I'm totally okay with handling the PR side of things for the moment, that sort of thing. So it's, again, it's that empowerment side of things. Great advice. SEO tip for 2020, number three, Sam Hempel. Okay. Uh, measure, analyze, and fix. So make sure, you mentioned Google Analytics before, Timbo. Make sure you have Google Analytics installed. Make sure if you can, uh, Hotjar is a great heat mapping piece of software where you can check and see how people are interacting with your web pages and so forth. Another one is Google Search Console. These are all free. With that, you can see what's working, you can see what isn't and proceed accordingly. The thing about Google Search Console as well, it will actually email you errors. Like if it thinks that your website isn't mobile friendly, for example, it will send you an email and say, hey, your text is too small or your buttons are too close together or things like that. All of this is free, you know, and when you discover those problems, you actually have historical data to go off to then fix and then compare, you know, two weeks later, go, right, let's see what's going on here and go, whoa, you know, site views are up and everything like that. That really worked. And you can, you know, put an annotation in Google Analytics to say, this is when we fix that problem. And off you go. So yeah, measuring, analyzing and fixing is a big one. Number four. Number four, seek out reviews and testimonials. So mm. I would hope that every small business in Australia has got a Google My Business uh, listing set up. If you don't do it right now, just press pause and go to business.google.com and set that up. But also, uh, depending on what niche you're in, whether it be seeking reviews from within Google My Business or Facebook, Yelp, Trustpilot, TripAdvisor, any of those sorts of things all help with your customer experience and trust, which then leads directly to your SEO. Google can see that there's a whole lot of trust signals coming from those, those external sites to you and saying, yeah, these guys are really great. Five stars, had an excellent experience, and that really is important. And that's part of your off-page uh, SEO stuff that I was talking about before where you sort of might work with a, a PR and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, love it. Back, the good old backlink. And I know, yeah. uh, you know, <clears throat> I have a segment on this show. In fact, your email to me was basically saying, hey, can I win the Monster Prize? Draw? Yeah. Which was <laughs> <laughs> one of the prizes in the Monster Prize draw is a, is a link on the smallbusinessbigmarketing.com website, which is quite Google friendly. And, Absolutely. Uh, it is very valuable. Sammy, you will get one. I think right. <laughs> well, you won the prize draw. You probably should, but you're getting actually an interview on the show. So sure. Uh, I'm fine. pretty stoked with that. Yeah. <laughs> Number five. All right. Um, seeking out opportunities for collaboration. You know, in the book we talk about, you know, we use the example of a local landscaper publishing a how-to article with the local hardware store of maybe when's the best time to lay your turf or something like that. So something within your niche that you could talk to someone who is related to your industry, you know, that increases the views for both you and in this case, you know, the hardware store and increases trust within that as well. Um, you're opening up your readership to their readership and vice versa. Uh, another example we talk about as well within this collaboration idea, as well as seeking press as well, of we use the example of a local guitar shop offering free guitar lessons to kids. You know, that could be a promotional exercise, but making sure that, you know, get local paper to cover it and get that word out there and collaborate as much as you can with like-minded business. And that goes a long way. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Sammy, I know there are so many more. Oh, so like, many. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's awesome. Uh, just to reiterate, content, write like a human, optimize your site speed, measure, analyze, fix, seek reviews and testimonials, get a Google My Business account. Everyone should have one. Yeah. Uh, opportunities for collaboration. That's just five of, I don't know how many tips there are in your book, but there is lots. A hell of a lot more than that. <laughs> 20 pages more. The book is called SEO for Australian Small Businesses. Yep. Sam generously uh, donated. He launched it in January, early January 2020, and for the entire month of January um, donated all profits to Bushfire Relief throughout Australia, which I think is awesome, Sam. So thank you for doing that and a job well done. Where can people uh, moving forward buy a copy of the book from? Okay, so at the moment, like like uh, you were just saying, we had actually planned to release it in April or May and um, with the fires and everything, we we're up actually in Shoalhaven over Christmas where we were very exposed to the smoke and the fires close by and everything and so my business partner and I sort of jumped on the phone, had a chat and said, let's push the ebook, and like you were saying, you know, donate all the profits. As far as where to get it from, so meum.com, M-E-E-U-M.com will take you to the ebook, and we're hoping to have the actual printed book released around uh, April, May 
way. And again, check the website, join our mailing list, uh, however you like to receive your information, follow us on Facebook, uh, whatever, to find out when the actual, the physical version gets released. But um, the ebook's only 19 bucks and it's awesome. And yeah, we're super proud of it. We've had some amazing reviews come in just over the last few weeks. And yeah, we're really, really proud of it. Good on you, Sam. I love your work and uh, thank you for what you do for Australian small business. Thank you, Timbo. Thanks for having And thank you for everything that you do. Stop it. This is becoming a love fest. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> Thanks, Timbo. All right. Before we wrap things up, just a reminder that you'll find plenty more where this came from, plus my entire archive full of ideas to grow your business is over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you're getting value from listening, don't keep it a secret. Be sure to let other business owners know about it. Now, next week, awesome, awesome guest. We catch up with this fellow, Peter Lorimer, who's a highly successful music producer who worked with the likes of Pink and Seal, but now he runs a Beverly Hills real estate agent and he has his own show on Netflix. Figure that out. This podcast was presented by me, Timbo Reed, produced by Matt Dwyer. Until next week, thanks for tuning in. Now get out there and take action. <laughs>